The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. The title of this message is The Beginning of Love and Discernment, and that's because uh, I believe that it's going to take too long to cover everything I want to cover, so I call this one The Beginning, which implies there will be another one after this, right? Uh, But Love and Discernment was a particular revelation that God unfolded to me during a season of prayer. But I want to begin before that. It was brought to my attention that there were things that God did that were supernatural, that this is a time to rekindle a supernatural Christian walk for each and every one of us. But uh, there are things that are no longer recorded. You know, we've, because of modern technology, we've moved from cassette to CD to, all right, well, a uh, great deal of what I consider significant has been lost over the years that might be on cassette somewhere but it's not in written material and it's not and I felt like God uh, really laid it on my heart to go back and and give a little bit of a testimony and a history to what God has done from the very beginning so this is called uh, love and discernment yes because that's uh, that was the the baptism of the spirit that I received it was a baptism in the love of God and discernment has been a permanent part of my life from that point on but I want to begin even before that because there's people that really didn't even know uh, a lot of uh, been pastoring them for years and they don't know the original story so I says if I give it today it'll be on CD and then I won't have to ever do it again and just say there's a CD with the story on the beginning but uh, what the Lord kind of brought to my mind is very often when I start a service, I'll say, he who began a good work will continue that good work. You people have heard that. If you've been in this ministry, you've heard that a million times. He who has begun a good work shall continue that good work. But I want to go back and show how that literally unfolded supernaturally for me in my lifetime. For me, that's not just a scripture. And so I'm going to start first things first. First of all, uh, in the mid 70s, um, I was smoking pot and making fun of a TV preacher. And I, I just had more fun making fun of that TV preacher until one day, all of a sudden, he points the finger. And it was like it went icy cold right to me. He was talking to me. I know that he had a TV audience, but I know that I know something very, very unusual and very spooky all of a sudden happened to me. He pointed the finger and he says, and you need this. And I went, oh my goodness. And then all of a sudden it wasn't funny anymore. It was dead serious. And he was talking to me that I needed Jesus in my life. And I received him by watching him on television when I had the only one intent, and that was to make fun of him. Um, And I received him into my heart. I said, cleanse me of my sin. I said the very prayer that they said right on the TV. And then the supernatural began. I took my pot, grass, marijuana, whatever you want to call it in those days. I took it and I walked over to the sink and I started pouring it down the disposal and my head's going, well, don't do that. You could at least sell it. That, well, even if you're not going to use it, you could get some money. You know how you, this, the, the way the mind works like that a little bit? I mean, I'm in conversion here and there's things going on that are not lining up with my way of thinking, acting, and doing. So I poured it down the disposal and for approximately six months, maybe a little less, nothing other than that 
was dramatic. It was actually no feelings, no visions, no nothing, except that I started getting into the Word uh, and started reading, and it was like this. For six months, I only had one thought. This was the way we were meant to live. It finally made sense. I used the word clarity, but it was like, this is the way we were meant to live. But very shy, wasn't going to tell anybody that I was saved because I'm not one of those. Do you know anybody like that? I'm not one of those that tells everybody. I don't buttonhole people, but all of a sudden, little by little, the only message that started to make sense to me was 1 John 1, 9, where it says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just. And for six months, I feel like I was like a yo-yo going up and down. I was the original bipolar person. I had high highs and low lows. But like a yo-yo, the only thing that I knew was that it was, being a young Catholic, it was so refreshing to know that I could ask for forgiveness receive that forgiveness and no, have no so that I received a calmness when I asked for forgiveness and I didn't have to go to that little box in the church. And it was like, wow, you don't have to get, go away somewhere and then make an appointment. That, but then I thought as great as that was, there was a downside. The downside was I, I can't do anything else. I've been asking for forgiveness all day long. I mean, I've got bad thoughts almost constantly. So it's like, how, how does a person that's a Christian go to work? I mean, I'm busy asking for forgiveness all day long. I mean, it's beautiful that he's cleansing me of it, but it's like, wow. And then all of a sudden, temptation came from every corner of the world. All the things that when I was wild and crazy and tried to get, I couldn't get, all of a sudden, now it was being thrown in my face everywhere I looked. So I went, oh, revelation number two, not only will he forgive me of my sins, there's, a, there's evil out there. It's overplaying its hand and it's showing me I used to have to try to be bad. Well, it wasn't hard, but I would try to be bad. But now it was coming after me. And it was like, there's really a devil. That was my first revelation after that I needed God and that there is a God and that he saved me, that there really is evil and it really is out to get me. And so there, there is really a, a combat. But the, for six months, the primary, the primary truth was that if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. And so I got to the point where I was convinced that this was the way we were meant to live. I would go over and visit my parents and I would basically tell them about other Christians, not me. You ought to see the change in, in so-and-so. And you ought to see how they're living. You ought to see. I would, I would witness indirectly based on other people's lifestyles because I still wasn't going to say me. All right, And that happened for six months until finally I got the nerve and I said, this enough is enough. I'm going and telling my mom and dad that I'm a Christian. It's time that I got bolder with this thing. I'm going. So I get up all this nerve. I get over to the house. I go there and nobody's home. All right. <laughs> so I went, okay. So in the meantime, I had managed to get Bibles into the house of my family, living Bibles, uh, but I got Bibles into their house, and that was a subtle way of witnessing. And uh, all I knew was that I was ready to tell them, and so I just kind of was walking around the house, nobody was home. I went up in my sister's bedroom, and I looked, and I saw a Bible there, and uh, all of a sudden, I being there was nobody to tell, I decided to tell God. That's a novel thought, huh? God, and this is the street kid talking. This was a really a dumb way to say it, but I was trying to convince God that I was serious. Did you ever try to convince God you were serious? What did you say? I said, God, I know this is the way we were meant to live. And even if I was, had my legs cut off and I was crippled in a wheelchair, 
I'm all, well, not God. I don't want that to happen. I'm just, I'm just using that as a point of reference. I'm just trying to tell him I mean it. What a terrible example. But I said, and I don't want that to happen, but if that were to happen, I'm still going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And I'm scared saying that example. I didn't want to say that example. But I says, I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And suddenly, without warning, power of God hit me. And to this day, I've not seen anyone, even when they got filled with the spirit, that was the same. My whole body was riddled with joy to the point that I was convinced that we would need a new body someday because I thought I was going to explode. The joy was so strong that this flesh couldn't handle the joy. And in, in my mind's eye, this is just in my mind's eye, I saw Jesus filling me from head to toe and I lifted my hands. Nobody ever taught me to lift hands. I was just a young Catholic that read the Bible. I hadn't had church so to speak. And I lifted my hands and I saw Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit worshiping the Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit all together. And then if that wasn't enough that the joy, all of a sudden I had an open vision. Now open vision is not in the mind's eye. Open vision means out here with your eyes wide open. In the air in front of me, and it's as easy to see it today as it did then. It said, there were letters of living light. I don't know how else to explain it. Letters, and it spelled out the name of a Christian bookstore. It was called Grand Book and Bible. And Grand Book and Bible was written in the air with my eyes wide open, and the letters were like living light. And when I read it, I could read, it was in English, obviously, Grand Book and Bible, but I read it with my entire being. I read it with my spirit. In other words, my spirit read it. Uh, how else do you explain that? And my mind did as well. But it was a both operation. And, I, and then all of a sudden, I'm overwhelmed. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. I know that I've been bad. And, and now I'm going to die. And, and I, but if, if this is dying, then uh, this, what a way to go. Because this was joy. So I, all these thoughts are going on in my head. But, and then uh, the biggest one was as a young Catholic, I had only learned about popes and cardinals and bishops and saints, right? And so I'm going, but I was scum. I was garbage. I was evil. And I got saved, yes, and I appreciate that. Uh, God saved a wretch like me, but I, did, I couldn't equate why this would happen to me. That was the battle. And it was like overwhelming. And it was a joy that actually ended up lasting on a cloud without a down for six months, at least six months. It was, it was a joy that I would walk in front of people and the, the tears would come from their eyes and not even say a word. Just It would just happen. But it said grand book and Bible. And I went, oh. And I was such a state of shock. I knew that that was a Christian bookstore in a local plaza, but I had never been there. Uh, I just knew where it was. And I'm sitting there stunned going, letters of living light, and why is this happening to me, and what do I do? And I looked down at the, at the uh, it was a living Bible. I believe it was open to the, uh, Isaiah, the first chapter, and the entire page went blank. I mean blank. I'm looking at blank paper except for one word, obey. So that was easy, <laughs> obey. Well, obey what? Grand book, I'm going there. I, I mean, I don't have any idea. What else would you do? I only have, I got a word from God, literally a word because the rest of the pages went blank. And this is with my eyes wide open. This is not mind's eye. A lot of people get visions. They, it's either a dream or in their mind's eye. I'm telling you, my eyes were wide open and I'm looking at this and the heart's pounding. The joy is strong. And uh, by the way, the devil was there right along saying, you're nuts. You're, gonna, you're, you're cracking up. You're losing it. Ha, 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 ha. And I'm going, but if I am, <laughs> I want to stay this way. So it's like, I don't, don't help me. And so obey, snap me out of it momentarily to get in the car and drive about a mile from my mother's house to Grand Book and Bible. Now, in the meantime, 
apart from the Bible, in six months, I only read one Christian book. And it was a real thin little book called Now I Bet on You, Lord. And it was the testimony uh, of a man who had been a former gambler. He'd been on the 700 Club and he had written the book, uh, Now I Bet on You, Lord. He, he got delivered from the gambling, and, and um, which, as Jennifer says, is one of the hardest addictions because of intermittent reinforcement. You know, you can lose 10,000 times in a row, but in the back of your mind, but sooner or later, I'm going to hit. I'm going to hit. And people will just lose everything waiting for that one lucky shot. All right? But anyway... That's the only book I read. And so I go to Grand Book and Bible. Now, mind you, the presence of God is all around me. I'm vibrating from the joy of the Lord, but I'm going to act like a normal person. So I walk into this bookstore, and I go over to this shelf, and I'm going like I'm browsing. That's what people do when they, don't they, when they go to a bookstore. They browse. So I'm browsing, but I am like totally almost catatonic. I'm, uh, uh, I'm beside myself with the spirit. I can feel the joy of the Lord. The presence of God is so thick, it's like honey. And I'm trying to act nonchalant, like nothing's happening. And I'm looking at books, but I'm not reading. I'm just pretending like I'm reading the shelves. And the next thing you know, as a lady grabs me by the arm, and this is, happens again. She grabs me by the arm and she says, young man, there's the perfect person here for you to talk to. And I went, who? And he's signing his book. Now I bet on you, Lord. And he's autographing his book in the bookstore. So I went, oh my goodness. He might. He's, a, he's one of those Christians. He was, writes books and he knows this stuff. But I looked at him. He didn't have a collar on. So I wasn't real convinced he had authority. That was my view of authority. You have to have some kind of a collar on. But he didn't have a collar on. And he didn't. So I'm going, oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I can't hold, hold this in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a shot and tell him. What have I got to lose? I'll just go home. You know, I, I just say. Uh, and he says, "Hi, young man. What's what's new?" Oh, I was in my sister's bedroom, but I opened up with the Bible and the I saw Jesus in my bedroom. And then, and then, and then, and then open pictures. I grab a book of Bible. And just, <laughs> he was so blown away. He didn't he didn't know what to make it. He kind of like. Um, um, and then I, I tell him the whole story. And I said, you know, sister Benjamin opened up the Bible and said, obey. And I said, what I mean? And then I went and he says, I'll tell you what. He says, um, there's a Christian businessman's luncheon. I want you to go to that. And he gave me the address and the time. And he said, you need to go there. And I said, okay. So I put it, I put it in my wallet and I left. And then I went and I'm going, oh my goodness. I, I don't know what to do with all of this stuff. Uh, and, you know, for days, can you imagine the kind of thoughts you had? I have no frame of reference. I've not had any church experience where this stuff happens. Who do you talk to? Who do you not talk to? I mean, who, how come nobody ever told me about this stuff, why I don't know what to do. And for days, it, it was it was exceedingly great joy and troubling in the mind at the same time. The joy did not leave, but the mind was actively trying to figure things out. Until finally, I said, uh, I've I've just got to. Uh, uh, I, I, I got to tell my parents. I gotta, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them that I got saved, but I'm not only a Christian, but I want to tell you that I had this open vision. And, you know, and I, so, so I got the nerve. And after days of, of just thinking about this stuff, I got in the car and I went to my mother's house. I flew open the door and they weren't home again. That's the second time they weren't home. So I'm going, every time I get the nerve to go tell them, there's nobody there. So I go and... I'm thinking the last time I did this, oh my goodness, what happened? And, I, and I'm going, and then I looked down in the magazine rack, and there was a magazine, uh, Psychology Today, and on the cover it had an article about UFO children. And I felt <laughs> nauseous on the inside. I felt like I was going to throw up. And I looked at it, and I picked it up, and here, educated people were going to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship to go to their father's kingdom. And I just went, God, why? 
how could intelligent people fall for this kind of stuff? Why doesn't everybody know that Jesus is real? Why doesn't everybody know? I, I, I could, because once you have clarity, you think of every, everyone else should have the same clarity. Now that I've got clarity, the whole world should know. Not realizing I didn't have clarity until I got saved. So I put the magazine down and I was grieved by it. And I said, God, why? And I went to a Bible and it started happening again. I went to the living Bible. It was in my sister's bedroom. I opened it up and the scripture came off the page. I'm not talking about, I'm talking literally. It was in the air. The Bible was here. The scripture was here. And I read it with my entire being. It was in the living Bible. It was Hosea 3, 5. And it was an answer to why are these people so deceived? Why are they, they just running around? Why are they doing goofy stuff like this? How come they don't know about Jesus? How come they don't know? If they're searching, why didn't they find you? And the scripture came off, Hosea 3, 5. And I believe we're in, we're in that season even now. It said, afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they shall come trembling and submissive to the Lord and his goodness in the end times. I believe that we're in that time and that season, and that afterwards was actually a picture of even my own testimony. I tried everything to be happy. I tried jobs. I tried education. I tried drugs. I tried parties. I tried everything. Something was going to make me happy. I was going to hit that right topic, and it was going to, but I didn't want religion. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor. But I don't want nothing about religion because I had Catholic school, and I, I don't need any more of that. And all of a sudden, it says, afterwards, they shall return. Basically, what God was saying was, after they've exhausted all of those silly efforts, after they've tried to do it on their own strength, after they've thought that they could work something out for themselves, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah, their King. And they will come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness. There's, there's repentance in there, but the repentance is to turn and come to his goodness, that he really loves us, just like he loved me. And it was, regardless of what kind of a life you lived, it was the goodness of God that he was going to pour out in the latter days. And people that have exhausted their efforts of trying everything else under the sun are suddenly going to return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King. And they're going to come trembling. But that verse was in the air. And it was an answer to a question from a troubled baby believer who just didn't know why everybody didn't know that this was the way you were meant to live. So I took that, but again, every time I go there, something happens and scripture's coming off the wall. I have, God, this is for popes and cardinals and bishops. This is not for people like me. I don't understand what this is all about. I am very, very troubled, very concerned uh, what to do about that. And this, all this supernatural uh, started getting me to question and it was like how do I know because I'm hearing the devil in there too at the same time saying you're crazy you're losing your mind you're crazy you haven't heard nobody else have stuff like this happen who are you going to tell when you tell somebody they're going to lock you up when you tell them that you had this thing and you saw this thing and 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 so I'm going I'm, I'm pondering and then I'm then I start doubt starts coming in I but the joy never left that was really crazy how you get a doubts were bombarding me like he didn't that man in that bookstore didn't have a collar. He was, and this luncheon, what do you know about this luncheon? Maybe you shouldn't go. Maybe you better stay away. And I'm going, I don't know, but I've got to talk to somebody. I, I give up on going to my parents' house because whenever I go, there's nobody there. And I'm in the, I'm basically all frustrated. And what happened was, Prior to that experience in my sister's bedroom, I did go to this church 20 miles away from town, from where I lived. 20 miles. Uh, Holly, you know where this is at. That's Niles, Ohio. And it was, a, it was known for Catholics and Protestants coming together during the charismatic movement and worshiping. Nuns and priests were worshiping with Protestants and, and, and power of God was flowing there. And huge crowds, huge crowds, uh, huge altar calls for salvation. Well, 
I was there one time and I was holding on to that pew and they were asking people to come forward and get saved. And I'm going, oh no, I, I know I'm saved. I don't need, I don't need saved. I don't need saved. And then he, and, but it was like pulling me up and I'm trying to stay back behind the safety of that pew and hold on to it. And I kept going like this and I'm going, I, I'm already saved. I'm not going forward. And so finally I said, I might as well just do it. I remember that. And I went and they said, uh, we're going to pray. You're already accepted Christ? Well, then we're going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I said, oh, okay. And I received that and nothing happened and I didn't know what it was, but I went forward and I went. It was right after that that I went to my sister's bedroom and I said, this is the way we were meant to live. Had the Holy Spirit feel the love, the love, the love, all that. So I'm going, oh my goodness. And I'm going, I've got to talk to somebody. And so I'm, I'm driving down Main Street where we live. It's actually called State Street. And there's churches on both sides. And I'm going, I don't know where to go. I don't know who to talk to, but I got to talk to an authority figure somewhere that's got to know what, what's going on. And I don't know about that luncheon. And I, I don't know about going to that thing. And I'm driving down the street. And as God is my witness, I got in front of an old Presbyterian church and the car turned itself scared me half to death the wheel jerked out of my hand just like if you got a flat tire it jerked out of my hand and i turned right and i went oh oh no it's happening again and i'm in this presbyterian parking lot and i'm going oh gee then the car's turned by itself and i'm gonna go i guess i better go in duh right this is i'm, I'm learning i'm i'm learning to walk in the spear i guess i better go in I walk in, and they had brochures, and I didn't know what kind of church it was. I didn't even know it was Presbyterian. All I knew was that it had brochures that said, you must be born again. So I went, oh, okay. That made me feel... Little... So I did what I did in that bookstore, because we get religious fast. I'm just going to go over there and browse. <laughs> I'm browsing. Next thing you know... A woman secretary grabbed me by the arm. She said, young man, you have questions. You can tell how long ago this was. Young man, you have questions. I've got the perfect person for you to talk to. She grabs me by the arm and she takes me down. And here, one of the men had a collar, so I figured I was probably in a place of authority. She took me downstairs and there was a man with a collar and another man and they were just talking and they were, uh, it was kind of like a private meeting but she dragged me down there and she says, she says, here's a young man who's got questions. And so I saw that collar and I went, uh, I wanted my mom and dad's house and I wanted my sister's bedroom but I opened up the door and I saw this thing and it's like, and then I'm, then I'm talking about the bookstore, the Bible, grand book and Bible and I went to the Bible store and there was this guy, his name was Don and, and he had a book and he wrote and, and he was on television and he's supposed to go to this Christian business and he goes, young man, do you not recognize me? Uh, uh. He just looked like a bald-headed man. That's all I do. You know? <laughs> he said, I'm the pastor from that church 20-some miles away. And he said, I want to tell you something else. He's, when he was having huge altar calls, 80, 100 people at a time would come forward for salvation there during that season in the 70s. That's what was happening. And Holy Spirit baptism was happening on a regular basis. Well, I went forward. There was about 80 that went forward for that prayer for the baptism when I went. And he says, I have a habit that he sits at a baby grand and plays the piano during these altar calls. And he says, I have a habit that I single one person out and pray specifically just for them while I'm playing the piano during the altar calls. He said, I singled you out when you came forward and God said, to me, he spoke to me, you're going to meet this young man again. And it was then that he said, your life, the word that I have for you, you hear it in prior to sermons and everything all the time, Philippians 1.6. 
He who began a good work in you is going to continue it. And you're go your life is going to be a life message. You're not going to give messages. It's going to be a life message. And it's going to be a supernatural life that you're going to experience. And you have just begun. Now, when I say it's the beginning of real love and discernment, and it was the real beginning of my Christian life. This is way before pastoring. And all of a sudden, it was like he was saying, this is the beginning of love and discernment. This is the beginning of a life message. This is the beginning of a supernatural life that will not stop until Jesus comes. So until I, Jesus comes or I go be with Jesus, the supernatural life was to be a life message. It was not supposed to be a one-time deal. And that was his reason for being there. And, you know, you can make a lot of mistakes, and mistakes are costly when you make mistakes, but God is wise enough, and this is the word of the Lord for anyone listening, God is wise enough to get you back on track and, and turn it to a life message. He can take your compost pile of mistakes and make something beautiful out of it. He can do that, and he's never stopped, no matter, and, but I'm not saying mistakes and sidetracks don't have consequences and that they're not costly. But what I am saying is we have a God who is wise enough that if you repent and if you want to, you can get back on track and accomplish the purposes for which he is preparing for each and every one. I sat and I just, I just wept. But from that time on, I knew that God was in charge of my comings and my goings. But uh, you hear it in the form of prior to a sermon, he who began a good work is going to continue it. But that was his word for me. And by the way, he's written books on love. His, he was known for being a brilliant Princeton professor who was a professor's professor. And he had a large church over in Ohio. But his message that changed his life, because he was charismatic and he was ready to just quit. He just said, you praise, you praise, you pray in tongues, all of that's good, but he says, and then God started working on his heart on the love message of Jesus Christ and saying, get down to the basics. And basically everything that he delivered was love, the ontology of the love commandment. He would go into, he would, everything was love, the love message of Jesus. So he was known as the love preacher and God basically showed me that from the time of that baptism in the Holy Spirit, discernment was as natural for me as, as breathing. And it was a constant. It was not intermittent. It, it remained and it remained to this day to where you discern, distinguish, differentiate uh, what is taking place. I saw that, that he who began a good work was going to continue that good work until the day of Jesus the Messiah, right up until the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. This is my prayer that I believe that God is going to take people that are willing to repent and get back on track. And you're going to see that he's going to maybe do it in ways that you didn't plan, but he can do it. He's that smart. Is that kind of an understatement to say God's that smart? But he is. The wisdom of God is I can, I can fix your mess. It's just a question of whether or not you will, you will submit it to me. And so that was only the beginning. And everything that's transpired since then has been the same as that. It's been uh, not mentioning all of the things that took place after that, but even... For, for years, uh, as, a, as a baby Christian, God gave me supernatural houses. I'm on my sixth or seventh house that was supernaturally provided. Remember, I was, I was on drugs prior to salvation and, and all of that, and uh, I had five jobs in five months. I was looking for happiness, and it wasn't that I couldn't do the jobs. I would quit. Because it's like, that's not the fulfillment I was looking for. I was looking for Jesus and didn't know any better. But I had five jobs in five months until finally I just gave up and started smoking pot and I was on welfare. But to be on welfare required me, uh, I had a mobile home. And I thought that a mobile home was better than renting. And my concept was if I sold it for $500, that's $500 you don't get if you rent. That was my theory. But by being on welfare, you put some lien 
on property. And so, in a sense, you couldn't buy or sell. And all of a sudden, God's telling me, buy my field at Anatoth for 17 shekels of silver. And it was funny the way God works with a baby Christian. There was a house we wanted to buy for 17,000. So 17 shekels of silver, 17,000 to my mind, that was God speaking to me. But I could neither buy nor sell because I had a lien on my mobile home. That's how far down I got because of welfare. You know, you basically sign off. And I'm praying and God says, pay back welfare. I went, okay. So I, I called uh, a lawyer. I spent $25 for a consultation fee to pay back welfare. He goes, no, no, nobody pays back. You don't pay back welfare. You don't do that. Don't do that. And I says, but I got to. I've got, God's telling me to buy and I've got a lien on my mobile home. And he said, let, let me look into this for you. He calls the welfare office and later a lady that, that, that heard my testimony worked there. She went back and checked the records, but they had never properly processed the lien on the mobile home, and so I was free. But if I wouldn't have offered to pay it back, I'd have never known that they had never processed it. And the lady says, I work in that office, and I saw it, Dennis, I saw it right before me. It was there, nobody ever just, they just didn't do whatever they were supposed to do. But if you wouldn't have offered to pay, a, pay back welfare, you wouldn't be able to buy or sell. Bought that house for $17,000. Turned out that it was a former parsonage. It had also been uh, a place where Don Basham, and you heard of Don Basham in those days? Uh, that was where he started before he got into full gospel and deliverance and all this other stuff. That was his place. And it turned out that I bought a parsonage. <laughs> and it was, that was the first. And Anatoth, by my feel at Anatoth. Anatoth was a city of refuge. It was a community of priests. Later when I pastored, it just happened that everybody from my church moved to that general area including next door, all right? And uh, it became a community of priests, just the way the scriptures said. And it just, it kept happening like this over and over and over again. And, and um, now the time frame here is, is kind of strange here, but I just think that God wants to reassure people that he's still working the miraculous and he hasn't stopped yet. And uh, you can read our books and, and, and jump into where I met Jennifer uh, 17 years ago, but it has never stopped. It's been 38 years like that. You don't have time to hear it, but all of that has never stopped. Nothing has stopped. So it went from that house for 17,000 to one day, God says it's time to get another house. And I went for a ride, and I looked at the sign, and it said Holly Lane. And then I accidentally turned right onto, onto Butterfly Lane, and I went, oh, I could never afford a house on this street. And I went back, and, but I did see a sign from a Christian contractor. And so I got home, and I went on the phone, and I says, by the way, I think, I think maybe, maybe I'm supposed to build. Now, this contractor did like like here, it could be six different cities. It could be Gastonia, it could be Charlotte, it could be uh, Huntersville, it could be uh, Rock Hill, it could be Lancaster, it could be, you know, all right? That's, he built in that big of a region. And I, I'm on the phone and I'm saying, I, I think maybe I'm supposed to build and not just buy a house. And, and he says, uh, well, actually, he says, you have to have land first. Then I felt like a total fool. I'm going to build he said, well, actually, you need land to build on, duh. And then I felt like a real idiot. My stomach sank. He says, but you know what? I've got a guy. By the way, when I went for that little ride and I turned on the wrong street, I saw a sign, Holly Lane, and the power of God hit me. But I confused it because the power of God hit me. I accidentally turned right onto Butterfly Lane, and I'm going, I could never afford this, so I dismissed it. But I'm going, the power of God hit me when I saw that sign, Holly Lane. So he says, but there is a guy that's been bugging me as a contractor to buy a, a plot on Holly Lane. 
drop the phone. I went, oh my God, that's where I'm going to live. And eventually, that's a story in itself. I built the house on Holly Lane. And uh, the, the guy that sold us the lot used to call it Holy Lane. He said, because now Dennis is on that piece of property and he's a minister, so it's Holy Lane. And from there to where I came down here without anything, standing in a phone booth on South Boulevard, looking for a place to live, called a lady and she said, no, I don't have anything to rent. And then all of a sudden, the power of God hit me in a phone booth. The power of God must have hit her on the other end. And she was, oh my, oh my, oh my. And I'm going, if the same thing's happening to her, that's happening on this end. And she goes, where are you? And I said, I'm in a phone booth on South Boulevard. She goes, well, there's a Wendy's. Meet me at Wendy's in half an hour. She quick hangs up. I find out the story later because she became my landlady. She called her friend and said, pray for me. God spoke to me in an audible voice while I was on this man. Uh, this man was on the phone asking for a place to rent. And I said, no, I don't have anything. And then God says, do something for him. And she went, oh, no, I got to do something. I do have that place on Tiga K, but that's fully furnished. And it's like $1,500, $1,100, fully furnished everything on the lake in Tiga K. Next door neighbor was a doctor. And she said, she met with me. Hi, my name is Dennis, and I just moved into this town. I go to, and she goes, you can stay there as long as you want if you sign a lease for a dollar. I signed a lease for a dollar. And I would sit and cry and look out over the water at the goodness of God. I had given up my pastorate in Pennsylvania. I'd left everything that I knew, and God basically just was taking care of me. And then shortly after that, and, and that's in the books. I'm not going to go into that. Then there's a whole supernatural story of how I met Jennifer. That's in our books. And then we're sitting. I don't think that Rock Hill house is in the book, is it? Is it? All of a sudden... Jennifer has to go back to Georgia and she's there with her daughter, Allison. And they're sitting and saying, we got a half hour to find a house. So we sat in a Hardee's restaurant on Cherry Road and said, oh God, I don't even think the Hardee's restaurant's there anymore. I said, oh God, we need a place now. We lifted up our eyes, drove straight ahead, turned right, and the power of God hit us again. And there was a house on Milton Avenue in Rock Hill, and it was for sale by owner. And Allison, who wasn't really walking with the Lord at that point, said, I know God spoke to me. That's the house. Does mom know that that's the house? That's the house. I know it is. Does she know that that's the house? And I'm going, just, just hang on here. We walk. And sure enough, that was the house all the way to where we live right next door here in Bailiwick. Years later, God basically said, we need to, it's time to move. My mom and dad were going to come and live with us and we needed a place that had a downstairs. And Jennifer, we looked everywhere in Rock Hill. We looked in Fort Mill. We looked everywhere and everything was a, it just didn't work. We thought we even had a house and we sat at the closing and watch the real estate guy literally destroy it and ruined it. Everybody was all upset. We just sat and watched and went. Plus, I had a pastor friend come from Connecticut. And I said, what do you think? This is it, finally, after all these months. This is it. And he goes, eh, I think the Lord's got something better for you. That's not the, what you want to hear is confirmation. Well, tell the two days after we saw that house, my house, house in Lake Ross, so Yeah. Two days after we saw that house, Jennifer's house in Waycross, Georgia sold for cash so we could buy the house in, on Milton. And, and the house that we're in now. And the house that we're in now, basically, after Jennifer, we got exhausted checking out the, the developments. She was online, and she said, well, here's a, here's a place we haven't checked. It's called Bailiwick. 
power of God hit. I went, that's it. That's where we're going to live. Never saw the house until we came there. I said, that's it. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I believe that God's saying, give this message today because this stuff, we don't have it on CD or probably on cassette somewhere. <laughs> you have your cassette player. Uh, but what God is saying is that Philippians 1, 6 is about to happen to whosoever will. That he who began a good work in you is going to continue it. You have to decide to whether you want to get back on track and go for God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And quit looking at your failures. Failures are costly, but God is smart enough, believe it or not, he is actually smart enough to put the pieces together to get you back on track if you want to. If you want to. The thing that I saw missing in the church was passion. I'd rather have one person with passions worth 99 that are kind of interested. Kind of interested will not get you back on track. Passion will. You're going to have to reduce yourself down to love and discern what God has for you above all of your good ideas, all of your plans, and all of your schemes. But I just believe that what God is doing, even today, is he's saying Philippians 1.6, there's going to be an anointing for impartation this morning so that those who are whosoever will, that he who began a supernatural life for you wants you to continue in that supernatural and you can pick up the pieces and get on with it. And like I said, mistakes can be costly. Don't underestimate the consequences of mistakes. Nevertheless, don't underestimate the wisdom of God to fix it and put it back together again. But he who began a good work in you, you've heard me say in almost every sermon, that's not a small thing to me. Because from that day on, when he spoke, that man spoke that to me, I saw the supernatural guide my steps uh, from then until now. And even with the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes down the pike in my life and your life, nonetheless, it has never stopped being supernatural. It has never stopped being supernatural. You were meant to live a supernatural life. You were meant to have these things happen. Uh, Jennifer said, how come I didn't have those kinds of things happen? But I'll tell you what, since we got married, you had lots of those kinds of things happen. So if it can go by association, then now is the day I want to release that by association. As long as you're within the hearing of my ears, you are a candidate for to be stirred up. Because God's already, the good thing is this is an easy way to pray for people because he already put it in you. It's already there. It's just a question of whether you will allow it to come to the surface and be what he wanted it to be. And don't look at your mistakes. Look at the wisdom of God to fix those mistakes and to make a beautiful garden out of the compost pile. He can make a beautiful structure out of the devastation of the things that have fallen apart. He can build something brand new on top of it, superior to it. By the way, before I started my first church, I, I submitted to my spiritual father of a large church. He didn't even know I existed, but God told me that you submit and you serve without having them pay attention to who you are. In other words, do it to me who sees in secret. I'll reward it openly. I had a prophet come later and said, because you are faithful in another man's ministry, God's given you your own. There are many people who are only waiting for their ministry. They've never been faithful in somebody else's ministry. They're only waiting for theirs to emerge. And God basically says, in that place of being insignificant and not noticed, that man out of a congregation of well over a thousand pulled me out and Leonard Evans, that, the, the, the man from that church for the Catholics and the Protestants, all met many years later and said, Dennis, we want to take you out to lunch. They took me out to lunch and three seasoned pastors of churches of a thousand or more said, I recognize the anointing that's on your life. You need to go start your church and you need to start it now. I didn't have to ever promote myself for as long as I've been a Christian. I've never had to promote myself. That it's God who lifts up one and puts down another. It's a question of the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. As long as you have to have somebody give you a platform, you're never going to amount to anything. Because God will do it. And no man or woman will stand in the way of your ministry. Don't use that as an excuse. I've watched too many of my friends use that as an excuse. No, no. Actually, you're probably the biggest enemy to your future. <laughs> it's not other people. Don't worry about the other people. Just concern yourself with you. And when I was ready...
to relocate. And God says, Dennis, it's time for you to relocate. We've been hearing that word relocate from Chuck Pierce, uh, Jim Gall. We have Denny Kramer. We had all the major prophets prophesy to us that it was time for us to move. I pulled out of my parking lot, and I think I'm wondering if we're going to Nashville with uh, where Jim Gall and Mickey Robinson were. Uh, I was wondering if we are going to Connecticut where we spent so much time. Then I thought maybe we've made relationships in Florida. Maybe we're going to go to Florida. And I'm driving out of my little, little, little next door here and God points over to this building and said, there's your relocation. <laughs> well, I can walk there, God. <laughs> what kind of a relocation is that? So I don't know why I'm here, but I'll tell you what. I'll be the happiest on the face of the earth because God knows the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. Do you believe that? I believe it with all my heart. It doesn't even have to make sense because by coming here, we quit traveling to churches. I don't know what that means, but you know what? God's not having a bit of a problem with it. We've written books from this little place. We've been on TV from this place. We got a TV program now from this little place. It doesn't make sense to me, but you know what? Obedience, something good's going to pop out of it. Yeah. Yeah, basically, I never asked for a house, and God supernaturally supplied all those houses, but he always told me that if you build my house, if you just obey me and build it my way, not people's way, because I've had too many friends that do it according to the way they think it should be done. And they, God says, you're going to have to love them, but they're dead wrong because I've given you a heavenly blueprint. They don't have a heavenly blueprint. They are copying other people's. They are using their own ideas. But God gave me a heavenly blueprint. He put me in a trance. And it was like a 20-minute trance in a person's house who had a stained glass window. And that stained glass window had a dome and three pillars and four foundations. And God says, that is the temple that I want you to build. And wouldn't it be terrible if Moses didn't build according to the heavenly vision and built according to somebody's good idea? Someone who's not responsible, someone who doesn't have to live with their choices, wouldn't it have been easy? But he built according to the heavenly pattern. Well, God says, start with you, Dennis, and then I will build your first church after you take care of this temple. And he gave me four foundations, no other foundation other than intimacy with Jesus that I might know him. Then the foundation of the doctrines of Hebrews 6. Then the Beatitudes and the parables. Understand the ways of God, not just the word of God. Understand his ways. And then the three pillars would be, the center pillar would be, would be intimacy with God. The second pillar would be transformation. That if the life doesn't change, all that teaching, 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 teaching in the church, they're learning, 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 and they're never coming to an experiential knowledge of the truth. It has to go from intimacy to transformation, then from transformation to application, or we would call it evangelism, but in reality, it's application of a life message that goes forward and that the waters flow from the base of that temple. The dome was love, acceptance, and forgiveness. That is the atmosphere that I want. So you're going to preach forgiveness until people get tired of hearing it. You're going to have people that are going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, they teach that forgiveness thing. But God says when it becomes a constant, you're practicing my presence. When forgiveness is the only way to stay connected because none of you are that, that holy that you automatically stay connected. So repentance and forgiveness is going to be a continual. And when it is, love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace is going to be the capstone. And back in 1980-something, I built a church that actually had a dome because that's what took place in here, not that you need a dome church. But God says, uh, that church still exists, but this church needs a dome whether you have the building or not because you're supposed to be the building. You're supposed to be living stones knit together. There's a heap of stones and then there's living stones. But God says, I'm putting together a life message. And if you don't cooperate with your life message, you'll never be that edificus or that building or that habitation of God. All of those houses that God gave me supernaturally was you build my house and I'll house you. Did he not do that to David as well? Huh? Solomon ended up building the temple, but David was housed. And I believe that God wants to give us 
good things. I never asked for a house, and every one has been supernaturally provided. Every one of them is significant, but it also told me something else. It told me each and every one of you, God knows exactly the place that you live. He knows what block you're on. He knows your neighbor to the left and to the right. He knows precisely where he's placed you because therein is significance. The exact time and the exact place in which you should live because he who began a good work will continue that good work. So Philippians 1.6, you might hear that a lot from this pulpit, but that's actually the story behind it. When I met that little bald man who basically said, don't you know who I am? I'm that pastor. And God told me that he has begun a work in you and he's going to continue. and You're going to walk a supernatural life. And he says that these things that you're explaining to me, these revelations, these things, he says, that's only the beginning. That's only the beginning. You're going to see these things continue throughout your entire life until either Jesus returns or till you go be with Jesus. You're going to continue to see the supernatural things unfold before your life. So, do you want to receive that right now? If you're watching by Ustream, you need to receive this. Father, right now, I just release that, that anointing that is on Philippians 1.6, that God who began a good work, he's rekindling flames within. He's re rekindling works and purposes. He's uh, igniting seeds to be opened up, that he who began a good work as you is going to complete that good work. God is going to restore the years the locust has eaten. He's going to get you back on track. He's going to take you and say that that's not too hard. It's not over. It's not too too late. All of that is from the enemy. But God says, I began a work in you and I have the wisdom to continue it. I can fix your mess. I can, I can bring to fruition. In one minute, I can do what you couldn't do for years and years with your own ideas. I release that anointing to begin and continue for the days ahead. For God has marked you as his people that there is no such thing as an insignificant person. That God's significance is being written on the tablet of your heart and you were destined for the throne. You were destined to rule. You were destined for his works. He predestined you to be conformed to his image. He predestined you uh, to walk in the plans and the purposes that he has for you. So Father, may this be the beginning of even the further development. Cause this be a time of rapid seed growth. No instant maturity, but there's going to be a rapid expression. Like time-lapsed photography, I'm going to watch that blossom bloom right before my eyes at a, at a rapid increasing pace. And God's saying, lay aside the old because I am about to do the new. Behold, now it shall spring forth to whosoever will. And so no more, no more, no more sighing, no more crying over spilt milk and things that have happened in yesteryear. Now is a new day. Lay aside the old and the ideas and whosoever will build according to the heavenly pattern, not according to your ideas, not according to your insights, but according to the things that God has revealed. And so Father, we thank you that we are going to move into a generation where we're going to be that habitation of living stones to accomplish the purposes for which God had for us. I release that anointing right now. Let Philippians 1, 6 stir in the hearts of each and every person. Awaken it just as an eagle awakens over its nest to incite it to action, to awaken, to arouse it. Just as he spoke to Jeremiah, that word is coming alive today. Jeremiah, what do you see? He said, I see an almond tree. I see a waking tree. He says, you have seen correctly, Jeremiah, for I am about to awaken my word to perform it. I'm going to stir it up and it's going to start spring into action into the hearts and lives of everyone present. Everyone that can hear this word, he is awakening that word. We're moving into a time of awakening. God's basically saying that in the process of awakening, recognize that, uh, consider, consider, Consider your heart. Consider that the Lord's house is laid in ruins when you paid more attention to your own natural house. God says this is a day to where you don't pay attention to your natural house. You pay attention to the house of God. And as you begin to do, change your ways and begin to open your heart to the house again, the house of my making, a house of prayer, a house of purity, a house of praise, a house of, of, of perfected praise. God's saying, I'm building a habitation. 
and for whosoever will, that you take care of my business and I'll take care of yours. You take care of my house and I'll take care of yours. For too long, my house is laid desolate where people went to and fro. Even as the children of Israel in the book of Haggai, they came back to rebuild the temple, but then they started paying more attention to their paneled houses than they did to the rebuilding of the house of the Lord. And God says the reason that there's no, there's no fruit in the barn, there's no seed in the barn, there's no things because you have laid it waste. But if he says... If you would consider your ways, know this. I'm going to incite the action. I'm going to stir up the spirit of Joshua and Zerubbabel. I'm going to stir within them a desire to work. I'm going to stir within them seeds to do the works that God has placed in your heart beforehand. God says, I'm going to cause you to be stirred up. And the people had a, a spirit to work. Joshua, uh, Zerubbabel, the prophet, uh, all had a and the people all had a hunger and a desire to work. And then he says, and think not that, that uh, what you've uh, laid waste for 14 years, that, I, that uh, in a couple of weeks of effort that I'm going to restore it. No, but on the other hand, from this day forward, I shall bless you. From this day forward, but know that this is a progressive work. Know that it was called, you were called to a supernatural lifestyle and a supernatural future. That this is not for a handful of people. This is not for just certain, uh, certain popes bishops or cardinals. This is for every, absolutely every believer. God's got a plan for your life and he wants you to get serious about it in the days ahead. And we thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Now say it with me. It's not too late. It's not too late. Okay. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.